Welcome to the second season of Murder in 20 podcast, where I, Bobby Stevens, am your host with a new episode every Wednesday. If you're a serious fan of true crime and love listening to podcasts, but don't want all that small talk, you've come to the right place. We get right to the facts. Murder in 20 episodes are concise and complete in 20 minutes. Less talk and more true crime. Be sure to like, share, and follow to learn about upcoming episodes. Thanks for tuning in. Now let's get to this week's episode. Wenatchee in Washington State resides near the foothills of the Cascade Mountains, where the Columbia and Wenatchee Rivers meet. In 2010, it had a population of 32,000 people. But after the murder of Mackenzie Cowell, it had one less member. Before the murder, people in this small town felt safe. Wenatchee is the apple-growing capital of the world and the gateway to some of Washington's best rock climbing. Mackenzie was a beautiful, bright 17-year-old high school senior with long brown hair, deep brown eyes, and a smile to light up a room. As reported by Peter Van Sant of CBS News, she was a young woman with a future who was at the heart of a family that couldn't get enough of each other. She loved to dance and was a member of the Appalette's dance team at Wenatchee High School. She also loved being a girl, did some modeling, and was studying cosmetology at the Academy of Hair Design. During class on February 9, 2010, Around 3 p.m., she asked a classmate if she needed to sign out if she was leaving for just 15 minutes. Then she walked out the door, into the parking lot, got into her car, and texted her boyfriend a quick hi. She was never seen alive again. When Mackenzie didn't return home from school, her father, Reed Powell, called her cell phone but it went straight to voicemail. Then Mackenzie missed her 8 p.m. curfew, and her family became increasingly concerned. They were a tight-knit family, and this was out of the ordinary for Mackenzie. Later that evening, police in nearby Shelling County received a report of an abandoned car near a driveway in Mission Ridge, 40 miles from Mackenzie's home. The police traced the registration to Mackenzie's father. Inside the car, they found some of her clothes and her purse, but her cell phone and debit card were missing. Police found one set of footprints at the scene, but no Mackenzie. The Chelan County Sheriff's Office began an investigation into Mackenzie's disappearance and used a helicopter. to search the area around her car for more evidence. The FBI was called in by the sheriff, but they weren't finding anything. There was still no sign of Mackenzie. Four days later, on February 13th, a person walking along the Columbia River spotted the body of a young woman and called police. As reported by the Seattle Times, the FBI made the dreaded call to her father to tell him Mackenzie had been found. Her body, fully clothed, was on the river bank, her feet laying in the shallow water at a spot called Crescent Bar, a small resort about 20 miles away from Wenatchee. In the CBS documentary, Secrets of the River, it was revealed that Mackenzie has suffered a brutal and violent death, a combination of blunt force trauma and stab wounds. Her jugular vein had been cut and she had been strangled. And the most horrifying act was her killer attempted to cut off her arm. The knife was still stuck into her shoulder. A task force was formed to investigate Mackenzie's murder It included top members from the law enforcement in Wenatchee, East Wenatchee, 
Shalon, and Douglas counties, along with the FBI and U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Police interviewed McKenzie's boyfriend, Chacon Villasano, and issued a polygraph test. He failed the question, but he had an airtight alibi, and police eventually cleared him as a suspect. Police also questioned McKenzie's mother's boyfriend, Joey Fisher, or Joe as he was called. Apparently, McKenzie and Joe had gotten into a huge argument the day before she disappeared. As she told her mother, it was either her or Joe. Police investigated Joe, but in the end, determined there was no evidence to tie him to Mackenzie's murder. Police interviewed the students at the beauty school and asked them to provide DNA swabs. Then the investigation stalled. When out of the dark shadows of Wenatchee, the police were handed a dramatic twist in the name of Liz Reed. She was a classmate of Mackenzie's and swore she knew the real murderers and had seen a video of the murder. Liz was also a police informant and a drug dealer. Could they trust her? Meanwhile, Mackenzie's family, classmates, and the town gathered to say goodbye. 1,800 people attended the local arena. Her dance troupe performed in her memory. And at the end of the somber ceremony, they released hundreds of balloons and yelled, Mackenzie, we love you. The apple orchards in Wenatchee were starting to spring to life. Now let's get back to Liz. She gave investigators two names, convicted criminals and acquaintances of hers, Sam Servais and Emmanuel Sorose, and claimed they'd murdered Mackenzie in a case of mistaken identity. Liz claimed that Sam told her he had to choke the bitch twice to shut her up. Liz also claimed that they showed her a snuff video of the murder. Investigators spent months looking for the gruesome video and never did find it. Liz also told police that Emmanuel ordered her to go to the murder site to retrieve a ring that had been ripped from Mackenzie's hand during her murder. Liz showed police the ring. They then took it to Mackenzie's family members, but none of them recognized it as belonging to her. Both Sam and Emmanuel were able to produce phone records, witness statements, and alibis that cleared them as suspects. The police had come to view Liz as a desperate informant, telling lies, and they distrusted her. Liz later recanted her story of the video, but said she did so because she was fearful of being charged with Mackenzie's murder. As the days trickled into summer and apples were ripening on the trees, the police were receiving new tips, and soon a new suspect emerged in the name of 29-year-old Chris Wilson. He was a classmate at Mackenzie's at the beauty school and was there the day she disappeared. And Chris's apartment was a short three blocks away from the school. This startling new tip landed Chris on the front page of the local newspapers. He was tall with a lanky build and a mop of dark curly short hair. His dark, deep-set eyes framed by thick, black-rimmed glasses. His face was long. His narrow mouth turned down at the corners. Chris was described as a dark personality who had an obsession about death and serial killers. He was fascinated by them and visited online serial killer forums. He also followed the TV show Dexter, about a serial killer who kidnaps his victims prepares a kill room covered in plastic, and satisfies his murderous urges. It didn't help his case that he also worked at a funeral home and had a tattoo on his arm of Hannibal Lecter, the serial killer from the 1991 movie Silence of the Lambs. 
Who could forget Anthony Hopkins' chilling portrayal of Hannibal Lecter? And Jodie Foster's award-winning performance of Detective Clarice Starling. Eight months later, on October 6, fall had arrived. The apples were gone, and the leaves were changing color. When police arrested Chris Wilson on suspicion of second-degree murder, he was held on a million dollars bail. Three witnesses had reported seeing a man matching Chris's description near where Mackenzie's car had been found. And testing confirmed that duct tape found near Mackenzie's body contained Chris's DNA. Police searched Chris's apartment, number 28, and using luminol, they discovered a stain on the living room carpet. Police removed the stained carpet and tested a small patch for DNA. It came back exclusively with Mackenzie's blood. Police determined this was where Chris had murdered her. Chris's mother, Kathleen Zorns, defended her son, saying he was different, but not evil. He was just a kid that didn't fit in the norm of a small city. And she further claimed that at the time of the murder, Chris was with her, picking up a plate of cupcakes. Amelia Savage, Chris's best friend, offered that he was eccentric, artsy, and a good person. But the evidence was stacking up against Chris. Police received a letter suggesting Chris could be a killer. The author was Theo Keyes, another police informant who was serving jail time. The letter stated that Chris had an interest in serial killers and dead bodies. Then another twist arrived in the name of Tessa Schuleman. Tessa had taken a video of Chris as he moved out of apartment number 28, and the audio recording hears the two friends wondering if it was clean enough for Chris to get his security deposit back. Then the video zoomed to the exact spot of where Mackenzie's blood had been found. Police examined Chris's computer and discovered a photo of Tessa posing as a dead person on the exact spot on the carpet where the bloodstain was. Tessa claimed Chris had told her where to pose. In December, police arrested Tessa and accused her of helping Chris cover up the murder. However, for some unknown reason, the police didn't follow through on the murder charges, but instead charged her with obstruction of justice on a totally unrelated case. In the end, it wasn't Liz, Theo, or Tessa that led to Chris being charged, but rather the DNA evidence on the duct tape found near Mackenzie's body. The crime lab determined that the DNA on the duct tape could be a match to the DNA swab Chris provided when he was a student at the beauty school. When police told Chris he was under arrest for the murder of Mackenzie, he showed absolutely no emotion, not one, nothing. It was December and ten months since Mackenzie's murder. Winter had arrived in Wenatchee. The apple trees were now barren, with no leaves to protect them from the wind, and Chris was charged with second-degree murder. Five months later, prosecutors would upgrade the charge to first-degree murder. If convicted, Chris could spend 26 to 30 years in prison, but he declared he was innocent and was set to go to trial. Chris's mother, Kathleen, High prominent lawyer John Brown from Washington State to defend him. He was a lawyer who represented serial killer Ted Bundy. John Brown, along with his co-counsel, Emma Scanlon, felt Chris was an underdog and developed a strategy that Wenatchee law enforcement were corrupt 
and had planted Mackenzie's blood in Chris's apartment. His lawyer argued that with Mackenzie's jugular vein being cut, there should have been a lot more blood all over Chris's apartment, not just on the carpet. The police didn't have an answer for that, but they didn't back down. They maintained that Chris had murdered Mackenzie. Liz Reed reappeared and was ready to be a star witness and testify for the defense. She planned to talk about seeing the video of Mackenzie's murder. The judge allowed evidence to be presented that implicated Sam Zervais and Emmanuel Sorose, but did not allow the prosecution to bring up Chris's work at the funeral home, his tattoo of Hannibal Lecter, or his involvement with online serial killer forums. But in a shocking move, just before the trial began, Prosecutor Gary Risen offered Chris a plea bargain. This stunned everyone, including the defense. Chris could plead guilty to manslaughter and serve only six and a half years in prison. Sounds like a great deal for a murder. But why would the prosecutors offer such a sweet deal? Turns out they didn't have the evidence to prove Chris was in his apartment when Mackenzie's blood drenched the carpet. Chris maintained that the carpet stain was from bong water and that when he tried to remove it, it discolored the carpet and that police had taken only a four-inch strip for DNA testing. So Chris turned down the plea deal. He maintained he was innocent and did not kill Mackenzie. Would his lawyers regret his decision? A quote reported by Fox News, Chris's lawyer stated, There are some cases where he encouraged his clients to plead guilty, even if they're 100% innocent, because the deal is too good to turn down. It's a significant risk for Chris, but he's maintaining his innocence, and I admire that in him. At the same time, I'm very worried that he's turned down an offer that was very, very reasonable. Now Liz Reed was changing her story again, but by now, we're not really surprised. She's now claiming Mackenzie was murdered on a secluded bluff, not at Chris's apartment. Remember that ring she claimed that Emmanuel had ordered her to go to the murder site and retrieve? Chris's lawyer says a ring matched a ring seen in a picture of Mackenzie. But Mackenzie's family again denied it was hers. Chris was still maintaining his innocence, and the jury was being selected when there was another twist. The jury had been given a questionnaire, and their answers indicated that over 80% of them thought Chris was guilty. This worried Chris, and he felt he wasn't going to get a fair trial. He felt he'd been unfairly tried in the press, and that the jurors were prejudiced against him before the trial even began. The prosecutor and the defense lawyers began talking again about a plea deal, and this time a deal was reached. It had been two years and three months since Mackenzie was murdered, on May 23, 2012, Chris, who was now 31 years old, pled guilty. He read a statement in court that he caused the death of Mackenzie by strangling her and stabbing her with a knife. He also pled guilty to first-degree robbery for taking her cell phone. Chris received a sentence of 14 years, far longer than the six and a half years he was offered in the first plea deal. Mackenzie's father retold reporter Jefferson Robbins, I have a really nice wind chime out in the front yard, and when that wind chime goes off, I think it's her talking to me. Chris had misgivings about accepting the plea deal. He still felt he'd been framed by law enforcement, that the DNA tests 
weren't conclusive, and that his lawyer's representation was inadequate. So he filed a motion to withdraw his guilty plea, claiming it wasn't voluntary, and that he didn't understand the consequence of how much time he would serve in prison. Now in this case, because there was no trial, a guilty plea means Chris lost his right to a straightforward appeal, unless he could convince a judge that there was misconduct by the prosecution or that his lawyer's performance had been ineffective. In this case, he felt his lawyer, John Brown, may have been preoccupied with another one of his cases. The appeals judge denied Chris's motion and his guilty plea would remain. In November 2012, in an interview with Wenatchee World, Chris would say that at his plea hearing, when the judge asked him if he had caused Mackenzie's death, that he paused. And I quote, I wanted to say no so bad. I wanted to look Mr. Cowell and Wendy Cowell in the eye and tell them that I did not do this to your daughter. I did not do this to your sister. But at that point, it was done. Chris was also asked, Do you wish you would have taken that six to seven year plea deal now? And Chris answered, Yes and no. I wish I would have gone to trial. Even if I was convicted, at least everything would be out there, and it would be a lot easier to appeal. And I think that would have opened up a lot of people's eyes, just hearing the facts come out in court. Whether I was found guilty or not, I think it would have been a good thing to have all that out there. So to answer your question, do I wish I would have taken it? Some days I do, but more often than not, I wish I would have gone to trial. Chris felt his lawyer John Brown had been inattentive to his case. However, his lawyer responded by telling Fox News that he had personally reviewed all the discovery and that he and his staff spent hundreds of hours on Chris's case and that the DNA in his carpet was an insurmountable fact unless we could seriously convince a jury it was planted. We did a great job. It's time for Chris to stop fighting and start accepting. The Oregonian later reported that the O'Keys, the police informant, received a $29,000 reward for the letter he wrote to police, encouraging them to investigate Chris Wilson for Mackenzie's murder. Chris is spending his jail sentence at the Clallam Bay Correction Center in Washington State, a mere 300 miles from where Mackenzie was living a great life before she lost it in such a tragic way. In Chris's interview with the Wenatchee World, they reported that in prison, Christopher looks down at his skin and contemplates what to do about the murderer staring back at him. Hannibal Lecter glows from his forearm, restrained by a face guard. He's thought about getting rid of the fictional serial killer on his arm, but that will have to wait. In prison, a tattoo defines a person, and altering it is considered a security risk. Chris will be eligible for parole in 2023, when he is 42 years old. Thanks for listening to Murder in 20, with less talk and more true crime. During spring break, we're featuring one of our fan favorites. Be sure to tune in next Wednesday for the episode of the Johnson and Bentleys. In 1982, the three generations were planning to meet in Wells Gray Provincial Park for a camping trip. Then all six family members vanished. 14,000 tips later, their mystery was solved. 
We'd like to acknowledge Purple Planet for use of their music, sound effects from Fastlane Studios, and our many editorial sources who were listed on our website. If you're dying to hear more, past episodes of Murder in 20 are available for free at murderin20.com and on all major podcast platforms. Be sure to like, share, and follow us to learn about upcoming episodes every Wednesday. And feel free to leave a five-star review on any one of them, or all of them. We're not shy. Stay safe, sleep with the lights on, and don't play with strangers.